Okay. Welcome, Rebecca. Today we have Rebecca Haynes, the Deputy Director of the Conservation Voters of South Carolina with us for the Eco Interviews. How are you doing today, Rebecca? I'm doing well. It's Friday. Thank goodness. Yes. It is Friday and we're right in the middle of COVID-19. So we're doing a nice social distancing podcast and video, which is the norm these days. But I'm excited to be able to speak to you even amongst all this craziness. And I'd love to start with you introducing yourself. Tell us a bit about how you got into working for the conservation voters of South Carolina and then like an overview of the mission of the, of the group. Sure thing. Well, my name is Rebecca Haynes. I am the Deputy Director at Conservation Voters of South Carolina. I have been at the organization since 2013. Um, I have been working in environmental policy, in the, in the environmental policy field uh, for about 15 years, more or less. Um, I was actually recruited over to South Carolina DHEC, the Department of Health and Environmental Control, out of grad school. And that was how I ended up in South Carolina. I thought I'd stick around South Carolina a couple of years um, after coming here from Atlanta, and it, it stuck. <laughs> so I, I did some watershed management work and uh, Clean Water Act work at South Carolina DHEC. That's, that's my safe space is playing with water policy. Uh, I went from DHEC to American Rivers, which is a national environmental organization that focuses on uh, water protection, river protection, water quality. And I worked there for a couple of years. Um, they have a, an office here in Columbia. And then um, it was while I was at American Rivers that I got to know conservation voters of South Carolina a little bit better. And it was a really intriguing organization to me because at American Rivers, for instance, I, I was really just uh, doing uh, ad advocacy work, you know, in regard to commenting on permits and engaging in like the regulatory process. Um, but I, I wasn't doing a lot with like uh, elected officials. And conservation voters was really leading the way uh, in South Carolina in terms of interacting uh, with elected officials at the South Carolina State House, affecting legislative change, uh, holding legislators accountable for their actions. I was, I was really drawn to that kind of work. So I was able to uh, transition over to conservation voters in 2013. I started out as the government relations director. So, uh, and I'm still the, um, a registered lobbyist for the organization. And, uh, and I've really, really enjoyed lobbying. I never thought, I mean, I have, I have a master's in conservation ecology. I, I'm a scientist. I really never um, saw myself lobbying legislators uh, to, to make, you know, policy change, but I've really enjoyed working in that space. And so at Conservation Voters, we, we do three things. We educate, we advocate, and we elect. So we're a unique environmental organization in the conservation community in South Carolina. We were actually created to serve the purpose of being the political face of the environmental community in South Carolina. So we are a traditional nonprofit, but we also have a political nonprofit. So, you know, for those of you that like tax law, so we're a 501c3 and we have a 501c4 and we have a political action committee. So we can hold elected leaders accountable in different ways than your traditional nonprofit. So um, we have lobbyists, we have a legislative scorecard that we publish at the end of every two-year legislative session that shares the scores of legislators on issues with voters. We um, use our political action committee to endorse candidates and to uh, play a role in campaigns and elections. So we have a political team. And then we also educate out of our you know, 501c3, out of our traditional nonprofit. We educate voters, we educate legislators, you know, we, we educate anyone who's willing to listen about current environmental issues. Um, we also coordinate with our partners in the environmental space in South Carolina. So we provide the administrative support for the South Carolina Conservation Coalition, which is a coalition of about 40 environmental organizations in South Carolina. Some of them are staffed, larger nonprofits. Some of them are small, volunteer-led. Um, and we try to give everyone a voice, particularly at the South Carolina State House, make sure we're coordinated, we're 
working in the same direction, <laughs> you know, um, know where everyone wants to put their priority work into. And, um, and, and I think it's really helped us to kind of strengthen the, our power, uh, particularly the state legislature. Now, conservation voters, we also track federal issues, particularly as they relate to what our state goals are, right? So like when, when the goals uh, have, you know, common interests, we, we, we try to make sure we're, we're working on it at both the state and federal level. We also, you know, continue to maintain good relationships with our federal delegation, particularly when you have state legislators that then transition over to Congress, right? Like we keep up those relationships. From an electoral standpoint, we only work at the state level. We only work on state elections. So we don't really work on county council, city council races, mayoral races. We work on governors, uh, you know, governor races. We work on state legislative seats. Um, we do not make any endorsements or work on anything federally. Um, we do have federal partners at the League of Conservation Voters. Uh, they're, you know, um, our partners in this space. We're not a chapter of that organization, but we, um, we're friends, we stay in touch, and they really handle the federal side of it. And so we're working on federal issues, we coordinate with them, but um, they handle federal electoral and we handle state electoral activities. So it's, it's been a lot of fun uh, from, a, from my perspective as a scientist who's, who's passionate about environmental protection. I can see change in action um, I can directly affect state legislative and policy outcomes, which is fun. And I don't, I don't think you can get that in a lot of other organizations. Uh, so yeah, Conservation Voters has just been a really, really great journey. Fantastic. It's a great overview of, of um, sort of how it fits into the ecosystem. And something uh, that you didn't mention, but is highlighted on the website is that it's a nonpartisan organization, correct? Yeah, and I actually prefer I prefer to use the term bipartisan okay. because uh, we fully embrace uh, both political parties, right? That are active in South Carolina. So we um, we endorse on both sides of the aisle in elections. We work with both sides of the aisle when we work on legislative outcomes, and um, I feel very passionate about working across the aisle on these issues. Um, we actually, you know, in, in South Carolina, this is a Republican majority state. Um, and if we did not have rep uh, Republican champions working on environmental issues, we would not have the success rate that we do have. And so, you know, I really value those champions. Um, I, I love the fact that so many of our state legislators uh, consider conservation and environmental work to, you know, be a bipartisan thing um and you know they they support that so um so that's one of the lovely parts about working in south carolina oh that's fantastic um one of the stereotypes of south carolina is that we are a bit behind the times and i have to admit that i sometimes think that as well even though i grew up in south carolina sometimes we're a li little bit behind the eight ball on things is this the case when it comes to environmental issues and what areas do you think need the most improvement and then if there's some big wins you can highlight that'd be great as well yeah i we've seen especially since we came on the scene in the early 2000s um there's We've definitely seen a steady increase in kind of an environmental ethic within particularly the state legislature, uh, but also with voters. And I think that that has, that has resulted in positive environmental legislation and policies um, uh, being enacted or like protections, you know, uh, uh, staying you know, steady, right? So um, there have been... A, a few different things that I think I would highlight as successes. Um, for instance, at its, at its core, being a conservationist is also fairly conservative, right? Like you're mm -hmm. wanting to protect natural resources uh, and use them efficiently and well. Um, it's much more expensive if you have to clean up pollution rather than prevent it, for instance. So, um, you know, a lot of uh, our, a, mo a lot of South Carolinians are, outdoorsmen right i mean like we we love playing outside we value um the beautiful places in south carolina um we even you know 
have a, a strong tourism economy because other people want to come here and visit it, right? Like people want mm -hmm. to enjoy uh, the natural resources that we want to protect. So um, we, I think our, our legislators care a lot about, for instance, land protection. We've seen some fantastic land protection policies um, uh, occur throughout the state. So for instance, um, legislators created the Conservation Bank about a decade ago, which is a state agency that works to protect private and public lands um, and make sure that you know, they don't uh, turn over into, into development. So incentivizing land protection, uh, which is just a fantastic program. Um, we've also seen legislators come out strong on issues like offshore drilling. So they didn't actually get around to be able to vote on the offshore drilling bills, this legislative session, because we were cut, cut short due to the pandemic. But we had a majority of legislators in both the House and the Senate, led by Republican champions from the coast, uh, introduced legislation this year that definitively said, you know, we as a state want to do everything we can to stop offshore drilling from occurring off our coast. And so they introduced legislation that would uh, limit the ability of the onshore infrastructure to occur. So the piece of the piece of that formula that South Carolina has control over with related to offshore drilling, they they wanted to protect us as best they could. Um, there is still a, a temporary ban on that kind of infrastructure in South Carolina because um, they were able to pass temporary measures. Um, while we worked on permanent legislation. So um, you know, hopefully when we come back in 2021, um, you know, we can, we can see more progress on that front. Um, there's also our legislature, uh, we like to, to say we have a solar majority, uh, okay. in, particularly in the House. Um, our, our legislators care deeply about uh, clean energy and the future of clean energy in South Carolina, because not only does clean energy help us from a air quality um, perspective, from a pollution and climate change perspective, but also it's, it's more affordable. It makes sense for uh, customers and rate payers uh, to have clean energy options, to have uh, market marketplace op options. And so, um, so that's something in, in 2019, particularly in wake of the VC summer debacle, um, the legislature unanimously passed um, the Energy Freedom Act, which broke down some of the existing kind of market and regulatory obstacles uh, and allowed renewables to compete in the energy marketplace. So that was really, really fun legislation. Um, and we are, are working on even more kind of clean energy um, policy work as a result of that. So, I mean, the amount of legislators that come to conservation voters regularly and say, I want to do more on this, help me do more on this is really fun and exciting. Um, even just this year, we had um, so much positive conservation legislation get introduced. Everything from, uh, there was a bill um, that passed the House and is now waiting in the Senate to pass that um, uh, try to regulate the illegal wildlife trade related to reptiles and amphibians. So okay. everything from protecting native South Carolina wildlife to um, addressing uh, additional land protection goals, you know, so, so trying to push the state even further in protecting more and more land. So it's, it's, it's really fun to see that. And, and legislators from both sides of the aisle come to us with that. Mm -hmm. Now there is a weak spot. Right. I mean, we can, there's always, it's always good to identify where you have room for improvement. So um, there are two weak spots. Um, first off, I would say that a lot of legislators do care deeply about particularly the negative impacts of climate change they see occurring in their districts. Like if you're talking to legislators in flood prone areas, if you're talking to legislators along the coast, like they are seeing the impact of climate change on their district. Um, but we have not seen a wholehearted effort by the legislature yet to directly tackle the issue. Like they're tackling the issue through things like clean energy legislation, which is a huge step forward. Um, but you know that we could do more there, right? Like there is an opportunity to push for more and more action uh, to address climate change. The other weak spot is um, sometimes we're faced with what we call regulatory rollbacks. So attempts to roll back environmental laws and protections. 
so this is where it gets pretty wonky right i mean all of a sudden we become environmental law experts um and you know we're trying to protect permitting programs or legal protections in the court of law you know giving citizens the uh opportunities to protect their private property from the impacts of you know neighboring pollution for instance so those uh those types of legislative attempts to roll back those protections occur fairly regularly mm -hmm. sometimes we succeed in pushing those attempts back right and and making sure we're protecting those environmental laws and and sometimes we fail and those are sometimes the most divisive fights we see up at the state house sometimes they can get more partisan because the argument is off often devolves into do you care about environmental protection or do you care about jobs and economic development and industry growth and that's an unfair uh position to be in because we can and we should have both we shouldn't settle for bad actors in industry and we shouldn't settle for bad economic development there was one rural rural republican um from the upstate one time and, and he has since retired but we were speaking about a rollback and he he said but becca my constituents shouldn't have to feel like they have to choose between economic development and having clean air and water and that's a very that's a very true statement we shouldn't put our residents in that position we should be able to protect them and give them jobs and we should we should and can deserve and require more right mm -hmm. so um so that's something that you know i i continue to push legislators to show to show more courage and um and independence on those issues i mean i think that's when um you really differentiate strong legislators from from weaker elected officials when they can make the hard and sometimes unpopular decisions um so there are some rooms for improvement but overall i'm very proud of the actions the state legislature has taken uh, to protect our environment that's incredibly encouraging we need to certainly get that message out i think there's some good highlights in there as you mentioned south carolinians are outdoors people i mean you know we like to be out on our beaches and our mountains and our lakes fishing hunting and that is certainly something i find that everyone can join together in is this enjoyment of the outdoors and hopefully protecting it and it was very um interesting and uh, poignant for you to bring up this uh incorrect dichotomy of saving the environment or uh, economic growth. I think as you very well stated that that isn't the right choice, you know, like solar is a way forward, not just for the environment, but it's also more economically feasible and cheaper in the long run. So hopefully we can get, you know, continue to educate and get those choices, like change that from being a choice and that being that either or, why can't we have both? Why can't we ask for all of it, you know? incredibly good um so how is south carolina uniquely affected by climate change you mentioned the coast a bit but we do have listeners from all over the world that might not be familiar with um, south carolina in particular and climate change we're seeing it in different ways in different parts of the state i think it, it the coast gets the more gets more attention because i think the rising sea level uh is going to be an increasing thing each year we argue about how to how and whether or not to engineer our coast or try to engineer our way out of rising sea levels um i'm a firm believer that water will find a way and the best path is just a backup um so you know that is an ongoing discussion um but that flooding discussion you know the the discussion of like what do we do when we have more water whether from um more frequent and harsher extreme weather events. Um, so, I mean, you know, here in Columbia, where I am, we've we've had some pretty historic flooding events um, in the last decade that I think shocked everyone. Um, and you know, in the upstate too, you know, as we um, as we build more, you know, in the path of water, uh, that's you know, that has a potential to be a bigger and bigger danger. Um, so that's you know an, an interesting thing of you know as 
as the landscape is changing and as uh, we have you know a changing kind of climate that affects that will affect weather patterns that will affect uh, flooding that will affect these sorts of things you know how do we continue to grow um, and build in the right places so I think that's going to be an ongoing discussion particularly for the coast midlands and upstate I mean that's you know there there are different um, different problems in each of them but some of the themes are the same um, you know I think particularly we are going to see um, really abnormal weather patterns you know whether we see um, increased drought um, you know I know our farmers have really struggled with just harsher um, extremes so you know if we're having too little water and having too much water are both both really bad uh, for our agricultural economy and so uh, you know that's something we've also seen throughout the state and I know is going to be actually um, you know a big a big discussion as we move forward, especially as we try to rebuild our economy in a post-pandemic life. Um, so those are th those are some of the impacts. Um, I think the hard part is if people aren't directly experiencing it, getting them to see that it's that it's a problem for everyone. Um, I think will be one of one of the hardest tasks. Um, and so that's why, you know, legislators that, that are on the front lines of climate change impacts are going to have to be leaders in this. Um, and, and that is where it generally does fall on the coast. For some reason, you know, we did analysis of some of our legislative scores on votes, like our, our scorecard a few years ago. And it was interesting, you know, I think of, um, I'm definitely, if I have a choice between mountains and coast, I'm a mountains girl, right? Like I love, um, I love ex escaping to the mountains. I think that's seen you know, God's country. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting, the, the environmental ethic, right, of legislators and like where they actually put their, where they um, act and where they vote, um, it tends to be stronger in the low country. Like those are our most conservation minded legislators are in the low country. The Midlands is in the middle. <laughs> um, and the upstate is is generally pretty weak on their conservation scores. And so that's something, you know, we've been trying to figure out, like, where is that connection lost? Is there less of a connection to our outdoor economy or our natural resources? Or like, what is it that, um, that, that falls apart there? And I'm not sure, you know, if that's also, if we're also going to see that same connection with um, the discussion about you know, who is most impacted by climate change. Um, unfortunately, too, I think a lot of places that are seeing the impacts of climate change are communities of, of color um, or lower lower income levels, you know, you see, you see inequity. Um, like we're already seeing, for instance, on the Charleston Peninsula and in the Charleston metro area, um, you know, there's this concept of climate gentrification where you see the interesting migration patterns of the people that can afford to move away mm -hmm. from the flood prone areas or the areas that are getting the heaviest impact from like extreme weather events or something are, um, are able to, and then the people that can't afford to can't. Mm -hmm. And then you see a real inequity in those communities. So, I mean, there's, there's going to be um, addressing climate change is going to be, you know, about addressing the uh, the problems right at their source and and you know addressing that environmental policy piece but then also making sure that everyone else is at the table to address things like housing and development um and uh and those sorts of like land use conversations as well mm -hmm. yeah wow super interesting i didn't realize uh the upstate was kind of checking out on it a little bit and like you said maybe it's because they don't feel it as much certainly our coasts in, in charleston is a big example i mean really a uh, international draw to South Carolina would be Charleston and the peninsula is very much suffering from um, or could be completely underwater in you know in our lifetimes which is pretty scary and then I think the Midlands was definitely shocked into opening our eyes after the flood in October 2015 that really was uh, an, an intense weather experience and we do get more rain now so I don't know maybe upstate just hasn't unfortunately felt the pinch yet which is a shame but um, right. go, going back to energy production, you mentioned that you have, you called it a solar majority in the legislation. Is that correct? That was the term you used? Yeah, we have a solar majority. Um, if meaning, you know, when we evaluate 
our scorecard and look at where legislators are voting, like particularly the Senate, I think, has had a solar majority for a while, but the House, you know, the House is larger. You need you need more indiv- you need more votes, right? Um, and so we have seen the growth of a so- solar majority, particularly since I think the VC summer discussion um, between 2017 and 2018. Um, I, I think it finally started to click for a lot of legislators that renewable energy is the cheaper, best path for um, for utility re- utility customers, really, and for the state. And so um, we've just seen this really interesting um, transition there. Like, so in 2019, when we passed the Energy Freedom Act, that was a completely uh, Republican majority led piece of legislation, both the House and Senate, um, you know, it was not, it was not a bill about climate change, for instance. I mean, I don't think we mentioned that ever in any of the messaging. It was about um, competition in the marketplace and how we can come up with like the best energy sources that make sense for South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it gets back to when you when you kind of cut out the noise of national rhetoric when it comes to environmental policy and you just get back to the common sense basics of um of how this can help our state it really brought everybody together so i mean i i've never seen environmental legislation pass that unanimously um in both the house and the senate which was really exciting Nice. Um, I had a previous guest on, Dr. Colin Nolden, who is an energy policy wonk in the UK, and he explained the solar landscape there. I'm wondering if you can um, talk to us a little bit about the solar landscape here in South Carolina. I know just from a person on the street, we see lots of signs talking about free solar, you know, and you see people putting up solar panels on their roof. But um, in terms of the actual nuts and bolts, what that means for the energy infrastructure, I'm not totally aware of that. And if you can talk a little bit about the Energy Freedom Act as well, because I'm not uh, fully versed on on what that allowed our energy markets to do in South Carolina. To talk about the Energy Freedom Act, you really have to start with um, the first piece of solar legislation we did in 2014. Um, and up until this point, um, South Carolina law was pretty strict about only power companies can produce and sell power. Okay. Right. Um, and so that's a short way of explaining it. No, that's, um, that's perfect. We have like, make it simple. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2014, we took the first attempt at starting to break down um, some of those obstacles to people being able to produce power on their property and kind of sell it back to the utility and have that net metering relationship. Um, so in 2014, you know, this was pre BC summer, the utilities still honestly had a lot of power at the legislature. Let me just um, interrupt a little bit and talk. Let's say, let's define BC summer because we've brought it up a few times. True. Okay. Mm-hmm. So so for those for those of you that maybe were tuned out during that time, um, the BC summer when I when I refer to that debacle, um, and there's a fascinating like if you want to go down a Google rabbit hole, um, po- the Post and Courier has a fascinating kind of uh, portal on that that compiles all of their reporting on BC summer. So if you Google Post and Courier in BC Summer, you can access all the articles they wrote about it. BC Summer was the expansion of a nuclear facility in Fairfield County. Um, And it was going to be like, forget the stats. It was going to be one of the biggest, um, uh, it was like the first new nuclear facility in a really long time because they are very expensive. The permitting is very intense. Um, There were a lot of entities involved in this. Um, The two main power companies that shared this project were SCE&G, which is now Dominion, um, and C&T Cooper, which is a state-owned utility in South Carolina. Um, And their C&T Cooper customers mainly in kind of the North Coast and the Low Country area. Um, And then C&T Cooper provides power to a lot of co-ops. Okay, so if you are a co-op customer, you may be getting your energy from C&T Cooper. so they, so this is going to be the answer to all of our clean energy needs forever. Uh, you know, we were gonna, uh, we were gonna be these ma- massive producer of nuclear, um, and. 
they were going to build, um, they're actually going to overbuild. Okay. So they, had, I mean, they, they were, they were, um, I'm going to build this massive nuclear facility. They passed the Baseload Review Act, which was a piece of legislation um, that they passed about a decade ago that actually allowed the utility to um, start charging customers for the cost of building this new facility before it was built. So we as utility customers, you know, I'm a, I was an SCNG customer, now a Dominion customer. Mm -hmm. um, I was paying <laughs> for this facility that was never actually going to give us any power. Um, and uh, it finally came to light, and I think it was, what, the summer of 2017, it came to light that um, they were completely in over their heads. We were never going to get any power of that out of that facility. Um, the uh, Westinghouse or the, the organization that was, was on the ground was going bankrupt. Um, they were pulling out of it. The utilities had decided to pull out of the project. Basically, it was a mess. Um, and so I think debacle is the, my favorite term to refer to it. Um, that's the short story of BC Summer. But what, what it did was it, it shook everything we knew about how we were going to generate power in South Carolina. And it shed light on some of the unchecked power, no pun intended, of the utilities. Okay, um, because all this time the Public Service Commission had been approving these rate increases. Um, the legislature had approved this Baseload Review Act that allowed this utility to recoup and just make money off of a project that was never going to actually give us any power. Um, and it, it really turned everything on its head. So it, um, when legislators came back to for the legislative session in January of 2018, um, they came back kind of incensed, right? I mean, their constituents were putting pressure on them to make sure this stuff got handled, that people were held accountable, et cetera. And out of that, we were able to say, but you know what can work is renewables and solar and other clean energy sources. And, um, and these are cheaper anyway than nuclear. Nuclear is super expensive. No matter how you feel about whether nuclear is clean or not, or the right energy generation source, it's way too expensive and not worth it. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to pivot to, um, why don't we invest more in solar? And we actually don't, this isn't a situation where we need more subsidies or something for solar. No, no, no. The cost of solar has gone down enough that if you just break down some of the obstacles and regulatory infrastructure that the utility companies had created to make it so that solar could not compete with what they wanted to do. If we break down some of those obstacles, we solar can compete, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually other things can compete. Like when, when wind is able to compete that, you know, there are other renewables we can stack onto this portfolio. So we introduced legislation in 2018 to um, you know, address all the different solar options. Like for instance, the quickest, cheapest way to put solar on the grid is to do the large scale solar farms. Okay. So, I mean, putting solar on your rooftop is fantastic for lowering like your individual power bill and, and putting more renewables on the grid, but, um, but the cheapest, fastest way right, is to do the large scale solar installations. Um, so, you know, you kind of have three different buckets. You think about solar in terms of residential rooftop solar installation, um, solar panels on our rooftops. Um, you also think about large scale solar, which like are the solar farms you drive by on the highway. Um, and sometimes those are owned by utilities. Sometimes those are owned by um, like solar, com like large scale solar companies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then you have like commercial users. So Google, right? Like they have a huge uh, server down in Charleston and they need a lot of power to run that. Um, so, you know, you've got like the, the commercial and industrial users mm -hmm. um, and that is its own, that has its own, you know, contract agreements and power purchase agreements structure behind it. So, um, so we wanted to be able to, you know, address all those different pieces and parts of like the solar and renewable industry kind of marketplace. We also want to make sure there were consumer protections put in place. Um, like we legislators quickly rolled back that baseload review act that allowed utilities to, you know, charge customers before they saw a project be complete. Um, and we didn't succeed in 2018, right? Like we, we made some, some headway on some fronts um, immediately uh, related to you know, energy 
in South Carolina. Um, but we didn't get the Energy Freedom Act passed until 2019, just because sometimes it just takes a while to get, get it perfect and, and, and work it out. Um, we still have room to go. I mean, like we, we've done, we've made huge efforts in um, just establishing a fair, a fair marketplace, fair rate structures and like, and boundaries back and forth between what utilities are paying, like the large scale solar companies for the power they're producing on solar farms for rooftop customers for what they're producing to make sure they're getting um, a fair and equitable rate, uh, a layer that goes into this. So for the investor owned utilities, like Dominion now, okay, so SC and G did not survive the VC summer debacle. Mm -hmm. They were they were bought by Dominion. Um, Dominion and Duke, for instance, are investor in utilities. Like they are um, kind of regulated by the Public Service Commission. So an additional layer to this is the the Public Service Commission is a seven seven person body. Um, they are elected by the General Assembly. They make a starting salary around one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, it's a fascinating structure and really happens outside of the view of most voters. Like I did not know my legislators were voting on public service commissioners before I really got into this. Mm -hmm. So those commissioners, those incumbents, those commissioners have been sitting on the commission for years and years and years have been approving everything that led to the VC summer situation, approving all those rate increases. Well, they still have a part to play in approving these like solar kind of contract policies and things. So like the Energy Freedom Act set up the infrastructure for policy change, but the Public Service Commission has to implement those policy changes long term. So an added piece to that is legislators have been trying to reform the Public Service Commission. Um, they also, before the pandemic, they were supposed to this spring be voting in four, potentially four new public service commissioners, four of the seven seats were up for election. Um, and so that's still a thing that's hanging out there that we're wait, that we're eagerly awaiting to see when that election will take place. There was a really unprecedented amount of people that apply to serve on the commission um, this time around. And I think there's an opportunity for a lot of like sea change. Um, so, I mean, there's there's complicated layers to all of this. Um, and at its core, it's how can we create a better system for competition that will ultimately drive down prices? Like we have some of the highest power bills in the country. So, you know, how can we also just take care of our citizens as well as producing cleaner power? Mm -hmm. Um, the, the last kind of layer to this too, is that, um, you know, SC and G didn't survive the VC summer debacle. They were bought by Dominion. Mm -hmm. Santee Cooper got under the microscope as well. And they're a state-owned utility. The legislature before the pandemic had been discussing um, what the future of Santee Cooper would be, whether Santee Cooper would be reformed, massively reformed, or um, sold to an investor-owned utility, you know, a utility like Dominion or Duke one of those bigger companies um or you know what they would ultimately do with it and that is also still now stuck in the ether right and and they're trying to decide what they're going to do next on cnt cooper if cnt cooper becomes an investor owned utility they will have to abide by the energy freedom act um either way no matter the outcome for instance we have been trying to push for cnt cooper becoming a cleaner utility they actually still have two coal fire power plants in South Carolina, they um, have the least, you know, the lowest adoption of solar of the other utilities. Like they've been the least willing to play ball. Um, and so there's a ton of opportunity there to advance clean energy goals in South Carolina. So there are several things happening right now, even though we've, we've passed Energy Freedom Act, we have nothing but potential mm -hmm. to make further improvement. Mm -hmm. It's super, it's very interesting. I think the South Carolina energy landscape is an interesting one that I 
only started getting into as I spoke to other people in the energy field and uh, the last podcast I did regarding energy in the UK space, they have a liberalized uh, energy market, which means as a consumer, if I look at my um, utilities provider and I see that they have you know 80% coal fired uh, produced energy and I don't agree with that, I can go look around and choose a different utility provider. But in South Carolina, we don't have that choice. Just like you, we were SE and G, we're now under Dominion. Uh, we also have Duke. Um, and that's where this public service commission comes in is because they, I assume the intention of that is to regulate a monopoly because it means the utilities have a monopoly on their customers. But what has happened, and maybe the VC summer as much of a debacle as that was, you've rightly brought up the opportunities involved at this commission that nobody was paying any attention to. No consumers, I didn't know who they were, knew what was going on and have inevitably, inevitably led to the highest energy costs in the US. I always forget that South Carolina does have very high energy costs compared to other places. So um, how do, how much can us as consumers actually do? Or is this where we need to be educated and vote Probable strategically to try and change this system that's um, maybe preventing renewables from coming into the mix as quickly as they could, or getting some new blood on that PSC. It sounds like if they've just been sitting there for decades, that uh, you know they're in cushy positions, and now they're yeah. under the microscope. What what do you think we can do? So there are a few different things. Um, first. Uh, Talking to your legislator and letting them know that, like, you know, the Public Service Commission exists and you know that they have to vote on new commissioners um, because it's voted by, they're voted on by the entire General Assembly. So every legislator has a role to play. They have a vote in this. Um, so I don't know what, yet when those elections are going to be held. They were supposed to be held um, right around now mm -hmm. <laughs> in early May. Um, and uh, we're hoping to see action on that before the end of the year, but right now it's, it's all up in the air about what the legislative schedule will look like. Um, so, you know, talking to your legislator and telling them that, that you, you want them to be thoughtful about who they vote into the commission and that this is a very important role, um, I think is, is a really great first step. Um, in terms of, there's actually still some active legislation. Um, if the legislature is able to come back at all, they will focus on legislation that is pretty close to passage. Um, and one bill that is fairly close to passage that passed the House um, and, and is now in the Senate is the uh, RTO bill. Okay, so the acronym RTO stands for Regional Transmission Organization. It's the short layman's way to talk about this that I prefer is this is essentially a... Um, a marketplace, like a third party marketplace uh, for injecting competition into the generation market, okay? So this wouldn't deregulate utilities in the sense that you and I would get to choose uh, which utility we were purchasing power for. But what it would do is it would force, it would, it would create this third party entity that would, that would force the utilities to choose the cheapest generation uh, option out there. So like if solar is the cheapest generation option, they'll need to purchase from that like solar producer, for instance. So on the generation side of where utilities are getting their power, um, it will inject competition. And um, we are the last region in, this, in the country that does not have an RTO or something similar. And in other places that have adopted these systems, uh, like an RTO, they have seen prices go down, right? Like the cost of power go down because it is injecting competition into the generation discussion. Um, now this bill would not create an RTO. We don't move that fast in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. This bill would create um, a study committee to investigate um, establishing an RTO. Now, study committees are only as good as what you put into them, right? Um, but uh, legislators in leadership in both the House and the Senate are pretty invested in seeing the study committee be effective. Um, they're trying to, you know, make sure it has like the funding to be effective, for instance, and to work actively on um, investigating whether an RTO is the right answer for South Carolina to join. Um, it's, it's definitely a growing discussion 
you know, in the Southeast. I mean, I think there's just more and more pressure. You know, other states are dealing with similar issues like this. Um, like Georgia has a similar nuclear problem. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think this is going to be kind of the next frontier, one of the next frontiers of what we do in the clean energy space um, to uh, inject competition and to drive down cost. Um, so hopefully that legislation um, can still pass this year. You know, I don't know how that will affect kind of the timeline of the study committee. I mean, the, this pandemic has thrown everything into a bit of a unknown category, but there's a lot of potential there um, to start that conversation about kind of competition um, in the utility space. Um, you know, there's still, um, we had other legislation this year that I hope will be brought back up in 2021. So like as folks are talking to legislators saying that like, you care about whether it's just solar or clean energy or however you want to think about these renewable options. Um, for instance, there was a discussion about whether or not homeowner associations can limit solar and to what extent they can limit solar uh, rooftop installations. Um, so there were some legislators, uh, Republican legislators from the coast who introduced legislation um, to address the, those those boundaries with HOAs and solar. Um, there was also, you know, a discussion about clarifying the tax treatment for uh, residential rooftop installations to make sure that, you know, we're clarifying that that you don't that getting solar installed on your rooftop does not drive up your tax bill. Okay. Right. So, um, so I mean, there there are lots of little kind of pieces and parts. Um, now that we've kind of address some of the big policy questions in the Energy Freedom Act that we're trying to address. So there's still an opportunity. I mean, the solar HOA legislation was introduced because constituents went to their legislators and said, can you please help us? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, going and talking to your legislator about, you know, what you're experiencing as someone who may or may not be trying to adopt solar or, um, you know, what you want just as a citizen, like how you want your utilities to treat clean energy, going and having those conversations with your legislators makes a whole, makes a huge difference. Um, they're quarantined right now, just like us. It's a great time to pick up the phone and reach out. Um, conservation voters recently did um, an advocacy one-on-one -on -one webinar, and, and we heard from a legislator, um, you know, that was really encouraging that kind of outreach during this time. I mean, I keep hearing that from legislators. They, they want to hear from their constituents about these issues. So, um, you know, don't, don't, let, um, don't let things get in the way of creating that relationship with your legislator, even if you're not of the same party. I had this question asked of me this week where someone said, well, A, I'm a transplant, so I'm not from around here. I don't really feel like I can talk to my legislator. And B, I'm from a different party than they are. I would not let that stop you. And, and I've, I've heard legislators say that is not something that should stop you talking to me. Um, they, they wanna hear from their voters and their constituents and, you know, as long as you treat them like another human and are kind and respectful, then y'all can have a great conversation about these issues. And I think ge generally I find there's more common ground than not. Um, so, you know, I, like for instance, the constituents that worked on solar HOA, they, they seem shocked that their legislators were that excited to work on solar. And I said, no, 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 your legislators are some of the best champions on clean energy in the state. Like you are lucky, like you should take advantage of this. So, so never assume <laughs> anything mm -hmm. about where your legislator is on these issues. Um, and like I said, you know, we have a solar majority, so they may generally may be with you. Um, so I think those, those will be great opportunities. We're hoping to pick up where we left off um, either later this year or into next year. Um, and finally, the, the last thing that we are continuing to work on, we don't have legislation for yet, are um, ways to address uh, the fact that you know, not everyone can afford to put solar on their roof. Um, I can't afford to put solar on my roof. Um, and my yard is pretty shaded, so like it may not be a great place to put solar. Mm -hmm. But I would love to be able to purchase a share of a solar farm, like in a community solar opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's something that we could have better policies on. So, you know, we're, we're looking at how do we improve options for community solar uh, so that everyone can access solar. Um, like if you're in an apartment or something, that, that could be an option for you. Um, we're also looking at how we can improve energy efficiency. 
Um, you know, we, we, we have so many people in South Carolina that are paying high power bills because the power is seeping right out through the door or window or roof or whatever it is, right? There are a lot of energy efficiency opportunities. Um, so we are also working on some work groups and, and looking at what policy outcomes we could, um, we could get in South Carolina. So we're definitely in the middle of some yeah. fun policy goals. It sounds, it sounds great. It's very encouraging. And it sounds like there's a strong call to action that you've uh, mentioned of contacting your legislature and, you know, expressing your views on these issues and hopefully getting a good response. Um, but we are also in an election year. So we will be going to, uh, well, we'll be going to or mailing our votes in, in the next few months, uh, both in June and in November. And uh, what should we be looking out for when we're at the ballot box? And I know you guys also have a legislative scorecard. So does that help us as voters make informed decisions about who we vote for this year? Yeah, please go check out our scorecard. We produce it at the end of every two-year legislative session. So right now the 2018, the 2017 to 2018 scorecard is up. Um, I know it may seem dated now, but it is a fantastic indicator of where your legislator is. Um, sometimes they improve session to session and sometimes they don't. So um, you can check out uh, your legislator score on there. You can even, if you know your legislator's name, you can even just Google their last name in CVSC and you'll get their page. Or just go to our website. You can look up your legislator. You can scroll through the scorecard. Um, you can see their lifetime score and their session score. Um, also, we have a legislative hot list blog on the website where you can, you know, get kind of the latest updates. Um, we are working on the 2019 to 2020 scorecard, even though legislative session was kind of abruptly cut short. It actually looks like the legislature is coming back this month for like a, you know, three week session or so. Um, we're still gathering intel on that. And the release of our scorecard may be affected by that. Like we, we don't want to prematurely release the scorecard if it looks like they may act on legislation. Um, you know, in, in late May. So we are looking at that right now. Um, our hope is to release the scorecard this summer. We were hoping to have it released by the primary, but that may or may not happen based on the legislative schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever have any questions about your legislators, we also have a list of legislators that we have endorsed on our website. And we're going to be updating that with another um, uh, kind of slug of endorsed candidates on there. Um, so we will be posting our endorsements regularly on the website. This is who our board and, and staff have recommended for endorsement based on their voting record. But, you know, it, the story goes beyond just numbers, you know, based on who has really shown leadership, who is consistently a friend of conservation, et cetera. So hopefully those are all good indicators. Um, we don't endorse in every single race. So, you know, if you, um, if you're not finding the information you're looking for, please feel free to reach out to staff. Our contact information is on the website and we'll be happy to help as best we can. Um, the biggest thing is, uh, you know, I know I already went on to scvotes.org this week and looked at my sample ballot for the primary, mm -hmm. uh, to check out, you know, who, who was actually, who had primary competition. For instance, I mean, my legislators don't have primary competition. Um, it's just local, local races this time around for me. But, um, you know, keep an eye on your, your state races. They really, they really matter the most. I mean, I cannot tell you how effective and productive state legislators are for better or worse. So it is good to stay active at the state legislative level. Congress is much less productive and much less effective. So if, if you really want to pay attention to the things that are going to really affect your day to day, it is at the state level. So, um, so please tune into that and let us know how we can help. Excellent. And you've mentioned a website. Can you give us a web address and then also any other way that people can connect with the Conservation Voters of South Carolina? Yeah, check out Conservation Voters of South Carolina at cvsc.org. That's cvsc.org. Uh, you can also follow us, please, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we, you know, hope to see you in that space. We, um, also, during the time of COVID, we are working with our partners in the South Carolina Conservation Coalition. We've been doing weekly webinars on various environmental policy 
um, and advocacy topics. So that list is on our website, as well as um, the Conservation Coalition has been doing a weekly podcast during this time. Um, it's me from Conservation Voters, along with the Congaree Riverkeeper and Coastal Conservation League are co-hosting. So all of that information is on our website as well. And um, so we hope we've given y'all lots of fun, interesting, different opportunities to engage with us, especially during social distancing. Mm -hmm. It certainly has been a big change for all of us. Well, Rebecca, I really appreciate this. I'm glad that we could do it, even if it's not in person. Um, and you've given us some fantastic information in regards to voting. Um, pro-conservation in South Carolina and really give an insight on um, the legislative process. That's certainly uh, something that I'm not fully aware of, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners don't understand the intricacies. So it's, it's a good reminder for us to look into these things, go onto the website, understand who we're voting for, and um, in understanding the gravity of the votes is how it affects our day-to-day -day life. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm happy to help. I mean, that's it is not an easy process to engage in the state legislature. So that's why we're here and hopefully we can help. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of the day and a wonderful Thank weekend. You. Thank you.